I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. We are with uh, Daniel Friedman, uh, and he's a newcomer uh, to Math for Wisdom and a new leader of our knowledge engineering study group. I have so much to tell about him, but we'll, why don't we have him talk about himself? So I'll ask him to present himself. I'll be asking his uh, deepest value in life, which includes all his other values, his relationship with truth, uh, the questions he's investigating, and where he'd like to take us on uh, the knowledge engineering. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. It is a great honor. So how would you present yourself? All of your questions are bound to be complex and amazing. So I'll just provide a brief epistemic preamble by way of introducing myself. I am aware of the limitations of the linearized speech. I'm a gap respecter. I'm a metaphor user, but not an absolutist. A pluralist, and I think we'll touch on many other relevant topics, but maybe that's enough for now. Personally, I went to undergraduate at UC Davis in California, studied genetics. And during that time was getting really excited about system science and complexity, distributed systems. Went to graduate school at Stanford University from 2014 to 2019 with Professor Deborah Gordon and was lucky enough to be able to work at her long-term field site in Arizona, working with red harvester ants. So for those five years, I was doing a lot of field work as well as dissecting ants, wet lab, biology, bioinformatics, and also still trying to keep that bigger complexity picture in mind. Um, after graduate school, I did a three-year postdoc back at UC Davis in the entomology department, where I was doing bioinformatics and genome analysis type work with insects, and also was getting more and more interested in the active inference framework and the free energy principle. During that time, moved from, I guess, being an academic entomologist in a field or a lab towards being more of an independent researcher and organizer and artist. And so that has brought us through the twists and turns and the slings and arrows of fate to connect in the love and the spirit of high our mathematics and wisdom and language. Wow, that's you're a whirlwind of uh, of uh, wisdom and uh, wisdom inquiry. Uh, so we'll go to the heart of your whirlwind. Um, what is your deepest value in life, which includes all your other values? And I've been asking uh, independent thinkers. I've I've gotten answers from eight hundred people or more, and they're all different. So this is how I can try to understand you. Deepest is just one of the ways that I orient my values. There's also such nice to things to say about my lightest value, my most recent value, my most mm -hmm. inner value, my most outer value, my longest lasting value, and so on. So I have to say, I'm not sure whether I should overly interpret deep in how I see that spatial arrangement of values or whether I'll interpret it more loosely as being a central or an important value. Um, I knew you were going to ask and I knew I wouldn't prepare anything as I haven't, mm -hmm. even though for almost all not to say lesser questions, but different questions, I would prepare something. Mm -hmm. Because overwhelmingly, these are not my deepest values, but legibility, accessibility, indexability, to me are like the coefficient by which information comes to be known. So though they are not their own beginning and end, end all and be all just to make information available, without the information being available, we wouldn't even be able to have the conversation about a deep value, let alone have a human existing in an encultured niche. So 
I guess I see a huge cohort of cousin virtues related to communication, um, accessibility, integrity, all these kinds of values or characters or aspects that bring us to that point of the question and the openness of the values. And I don't know if I have an English word or phrase, but I do know that the inquiry is alive and that an authentic answer is an answer of its own kind. And I look forward to adding more and refining and recombining expressions to really come to understand that as I still feel young. So you're young, but you've, you know, you have thought about things from many different directions and you're careful to include uh, those directions. Um, and so maybe I would add um, from a practical point of view, like why, why would I care to ask these things? Uh, and you met uh, Franz, maybe you have, you met Franz Narada, yes, uh, when we talked about consciousness of a nation, um, at least you saw him. And uh, so I was organizing independent thinkers and he was like the first like robust uh, visionary, uh, you know, um, independent thinker, mature independent thinker that I got to work with. And, and that's when I started collecting these, just asking people, like trying to understand, like, where were they coming from? You see, just so that I could be able to uh, empathize with them and then um, connect them with other people. So that's one practical uh, reason that I ask this. And it's not about their projects. It's about them as a person. You know, how are they approaching life? Um, so we could be connecting on that level. Uh, so uh, deep in that sense, let's say. But also, um, you know, getting at the heart of the person. But also, from a practical point of view, um, it, well... Where, why do I think it arises in the many, you know, hundreds of independent thinkers that I've gotten to engage? Uh, it's because uh, in this path of growth, uh, it's probably latent in people. It's, it's, um, it's maybe the core of their personality. It's their soul, uh, but it's how they integrate themselves. So this comes up especially when you have different values because you have different kinds of projects and they start to clash, you know, and you need to figure out how to resolve that, right? Like what's the rule by which you're going to resolve things? So some people would appeal to God, you know, and other people would appeal to family, you know, or other people to, to faith or to friendship or to um, freedom or to love, let's say, and they're all probably different aspects of love. But so how do you integrate it all when you have those? So, it, it, that's why I say deepest value, which includes all your other values. So with your family, with your aunts, let's say, with your um, work, uh, with your personal hobbies, how do you make that decision? And I can already hear in what you said, maybe to make it more, um, like you said, making information available. You see, so there's these different things, but they all become important if you want to make information available. See, so that kicks in or like some kind of integrity you mentioned, Right or bringing the question, you know, to the openness. See, so those things all hint to what your deepest value could be. And I don't think that they don't change very much. You see, they probably don't change, but it's, they become more clear. It's like a star in the sky that sees the whole sky, but from one point. And so we're kind of like trees, you know, we invest in a location and we don't move around, but like we grow bigger and bigger and more entrenched. Like that Ant Connolly typically does not move, you know, so it becomes more established. Okay, I'll try to reapproach it. So, um, if we were talking about heat gradients, mm -hmm. any given heat gradient, we have a little joke um, that three things could um, happen. It could either be a bomb, a dud, or an engine. Like either the gas um, in the tank, it could either spontaneously combust and cause damage, mm -hmm. nothing could happen or it could be used to, to channel an engine. Um, and that's true of heat gradients for physical work. It's also true of information gradients. Um, so it isn't that every piece of information 
merely simply should be available to all, but there are these gradients of information and heat and resources and attention. And the question is, will they be a bomb, a dud, or an engine? Mm -hmm. I also, on that engine note, come to the motto of the Active Inference Institute, which is act, infer, serve. Now with act and infer, we have the minimum of two to describe a generic cognitive system. So there's a kind of perhaps secular or perhaps scientific closure of active inference because you've already described the system of interest, but let's just say that we do have that two stroke engine that can take the info heat gradient and not make it explode and not make it do nothing. Okay, so it's an engine, amazing, now what? And that is where we have service and the still small voice and the complexity and the contextuality of the moment and what happens with that steers person, that cybernetic moment, that trim tab moment on the boat with the action inference engine. Now service is being engaged, but even that isn't a simple question because there might be multiple drowning people or there might be clashing requirements or requests. So I um, buffer and bound and respect that scenario and find that stories and allegory and nonlinear reference help me more actionably in that moment in space. And I have all kinds of words and symbols that I love as well. See, so there's a scenario that you're beautifully uh, describing, which seems to be scoping out that uh, territory, right? Like kind of like, you know, presenting that territory. And so I'll just keep, um, <laughs> because I'm just a very uh, insistent person, <laughs> but I'll just keep going to say, okay, so how would we phrase, you know, because uh, I mean, I'm just mechanically operating in a certain sense. So I have to be kind of careful, but, but in the end, like how to phrase this, to get the heart of it, to capture it, to say, oh, that feels, you know, that feels doing justice to that, you know, and then that's a point of course that today, and then like a year from now or 10 years from now, you could look and say, well, has that really changed? Maybe it'll become more clear, you know, maybe it'll have changed, but kind of doubt it, but, but um, so what I heard, uh, what I've been trying to write, like, you know, there's an information gradient. There's these three possibilities. Like you say, you could have a bomb, an information bomb, an information dud, but, or you can have an information engine, right? But your focus is on the engine, I think, right? Like, or. The engine is an engineering task and it mm -hmm. opens us up to service at the um, cybernetic helm. And now with service as a mission at the cybernetic helm, how will we know what value guides our service? So now we're at a third level beyond the kind of engineering and scientific um, virtues that enable the engine, mm -hmm. beyond the charge of service as being the operator's duty and responsibility. Now, how is that service accomplished and evaluated? What comes to mind is awareness not as the end either in and of, of itself, but with total awareness of the situation, we would be able to do the best service. And that awareness could include feedback from other perspectives. It could include awareness of our deepest and other um, values. But, and, and I, I also appreciate that deeper time perspective. I am calling it like I see it now so that we can know more and different later. Yeah, we're, we're, I mean, all we can do is pragmatically is to do it now. But, you know, and so it's a religious difference. You know, I have this absolute faith. So, you know, I'm looking. So I'm willing to say, well, if there are absolutes, like this notion of a deepest value would be a candidate, you see. And this would be an instance of data, right? 
Now, if you don't believe in absolutes, then you don't have to play that game. But but it makes concrete, like I'm saying, well, you know, and why? You know, why would you have one? You know, why would you have any? You know, but the idea is that this is a natural result of how people are growing as independent thinkers. You know, so, you know, that it's somehow like in the beginning, you don't you're not aware. But in this path of growing, you 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 end up kind of accumulating all these things that kind of reveal, you know, it's fate and free will all together, but you're kind of destined to have this personality that kind of integrates things in a certain way. And it's just a matter if you're going to unfold yourself or not. And, but, so, but, but this is where you'll end up. So. I, I could, I could say more things on that. Like it reminds me of um, graduate school and academia and biology right. and how some people are, very driven by the system of interest like they love this ant species or they love the rainforest in this one location and so whether it's a you know a bird or a human impact or a plant in that space they want to be there and so it's the system that drives them and then also there's question orientation and that is like well we're studying this ant today but the big mm -hmm. questions are about distributed systems and so tomorrow when a different system is needed to answer the question, we'll, we'll go to that system. And so understanding the first mode, but myself being more oriented to the second mode, helped me move amongst many systems and get kind of a sample size on the lower or the more material level, again, to enable or at least point out to, if only by absence, what else there was. And and this is very much relevant uh, to the culture of math for wisdom and the spirit of math for wisdom. And, and even the wondrous wisdom like to say, well, even this notion of like three minds. So like you have a mind that knows and that'll know your deepest value. Like let's say it's going to report, you know, well, this, you know, this is the one that would tell you. But once you know your yourself, like the Greeks would say, you know, know thyself, right? Well, then, um, if you can say your deepest value, then in a certain sense, you're, you've answered that question. The, but then you can move on and say, okay, but there's all these things I don't know. And it's more mature or maybe more fruitful or more interesting to live in terms of the questions about what I don't know, rather than, you know, just talk about what I do know, which is just not very efficient. So um, if, if and then all these other stars in the sky with their deepest values, you then you can go ask them questions like I see things here this way, but how does it look like to you? How does it look like to you? Because I'd like to get a better understanding of how it looks. See, so this is a natural um, part, you know, now this is partly practical, partly theoretical, partly debatable. But 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 the point is, is that's what from the culture you also clearly like when when we um talked about uh, you leading a knowledge engineering group you know it's very nice that's a very good choice because based on how you're talking about things like that's very central and natural for your leadership um and it's exciting and you know because you've done a lot in that area but you know that you will want to do things you have questions about that and so when i listen to you uh take it to this meta level again and we can go as far as we can go, but uh, as deep as we can go, as high as we can go, but uh, as uh, broad as we can go. But you do talk about service. Um, so service has a mission. And I think I wrote down like total awareness of our situation for the sake of uh, service, let's say. And... Is that in the right direction or is that, uh, and how would you correct it or expand on it? Every linearization is dead. I put service and awareness into the ant colony and let them ferment together. Service, in service of awareness, awareness of service, situational awareness in the moment so service can unfold. Like, I don't see a need to reduce into a sentence these concepts which can merely be held in a linguistic but non-verbalized form so what but okay you don't but, but but and this is just my laziness or efficiency order like to be able to kind of like uh you know if it's possible you know to extend or maybe it's not possible so to be honest to the situation but so that's why i'm uh i'm checking like but so first of all service and awareness are central in this thing it's not the machine for example that's so central i'm hearing it's more the 
They are both. And I wonder if they form a minimum of two mm -hmm. because um, energized service would find the relevant level of awareness needed and in a different way awareness may either directly or prepare one for the recognition of duty and service and so okay so they're all only, relevant here right like if it if it could be a reflective pair such that awareness of awareness would beget service and a commitment to service would beget awareness, then the two of them would never have to be reduced to one. Could you, uh, commitment, could you say that again, just so I could catch up with you? Awareness of awareness? If, if we could enter through awareness mm -hmm. and that just becoming more aware through learning, diverse perspectives, meditation, and so on, prayer. If through awareness, we could mobilize service within ourselves, mm -hmm. and or maybe we could enter through the service door, and then that would come to grow to the appropriate level of awareness for that level of service or that type. Service growing to the appropriate level of awareness? Any and all. I mean, especially with language models and the um, extreme multimodal environment that we're in, where a given expression has a cloud of counterfactuals that are like closely cousin sentences, and we can understand that in a vector space, and we can understand these other ways, like... I just see each expression as like a dart or a flash in the dark. And, and then it's the sheath around it and the bundle and the fiber and the topos and all these fun things that I barely even know the details of, mm -hmm. but I know enough to know that with just one grain of sand, we can take it so far. What do you mean by that? With one grain of sand, we can take it so far. Like a given, if someone says, um, could you go to the store and buy milk? Mm -hmm. Yes, that has a kind of primary semantics about asking to buy milk, mm -hmm. but it's also a mega truth drop on grammar and the English language. But usually that's not how that kind of a sentence is being interpreted. Mm -hmm. So in this value space where even if it could be and has been, distilled into um, a singularized, linearized sentence, that sentence doesn't contain the semantics. It, it's just a cue for others to re-enliven what it means to them, leading, you know, to depend yes, on your and, um, is. And so some people are not very sensitive to this. You are sufficiently sensitive to this, you know, on the one hand, like in terms of, because most people would not bring this up. You know, or they would bring it up in different ways or to different degrees or however, you know, in different circumstances. So that's one. Another is um, I'm a skeptic of language, uh, so I'm trying not to think in terms of language. And that's why, like, you know, when I talk about this deepest value, it's like that's not a linguistic thing. You see, that's something that's a pragmatic thing. You know, it's a game. Could you play this game? Would you want to play this game or whatever? But it's not um, it's not really a linguistic game. It's a conceptual game. And so then we use words, you know, just as a scaffolding, like to get around so the words can be changed or whatever. That's not the, but the point is, are you pinning yourself down? You know, like how well can you pin yourself down so that you could be understood? Because like you would want to be pinned down, like you would want to be understood correctly, presumably, you know, I think that's common uh, or that's my purpose, at least, you know, I don't want to misunderstand you. Well, I'll say, um, by language, I do mean more than linguistics. Mm -hmm. And I see language as the pragmatism itself. It is how information is transferred in an ecological setting amongst similar and different kinds of entities. I think it's another journey to explore more into the, the role of language. But even the fact that, for example, you're looking for an English sentence 
uh, for what is a deepest value. So how do you it doesn't reconcile... have to be in English actually, but uh... oh, it, but 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 a. Uh... And it doesn't have but to be a sentence, a word that... or a phrase, you know, but it could be a sentence. But I'll but give an example, like symbol? when you when could you say a symbol or a drawing. Pardon? Could it be a symbol or a drawing? It wouldn't hurt. I mean, you know, it, it's just a part of practicality, you know, if that's. Um, but I mean, that's. Uh, and I go then I go with the tet. Okay, the tetrahedron. And so, what does the tetrahedron mean for you? Like when you have the. The meaning isn't in the tet. It's in the infinite spin outs in the moment of considering it and then taking it in a situationally aware direction and how many how much i i i wouldn't say that the deepest value is a tetrahedron <laughs> but well, i would i mean i would write that down <laughs> so that's why i say like i you know we were but, getting but, pretty close to something so i don't know but for example filling out a form that said what is your deepest value and putting a tetrahedron Mm -hmm. can be understood as a higher level communication that isn't only interpretable as a tetrahedra as being the direct answer to the question. And ripping up the form would also be communication. You know, there's lots of ways to, but so, but to kind of speak about, like you mentioned, act, infer, serve, is that right? Yeah. And yes. so just taking active inference and then adding, I think you, you add to this, right? Or, or you were... right. The service is not part of the theoretical apparatus. Right. The whole point is we don't need that. It's like, you can talk, build the engine and talk about how many horsepower it has with zero discussion of who, what, why, where, when, and how is mm -hmm. it going to be used. And that is actually the, um, the separation between what something is and how it's used. And so, but it's very fitting for an active inference institute, but it's also very telling in the sense that it says, well, as an institute, this is what we're about. We're here to serve, right? I mean, that's how I understand it. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So it's very, and it's, it's very brief. It's very clear. It's very uh, memorable. But like when I hear that, I go, I am very quickly check. Oh, I suspect like one way to think about it, you know, would be this three cycle, like I talk about, like you take a stand, you follow through, you reflect. So now service would then be, be this being more, you know, like inferring would be thinking, you know, you reflect on anything, but service would be like this attitude. It's not so much the, because the action is the action, but the service is this attitude, like, well, what stand am I going to take? You know, what values am I going to so, and maybe that's one way even to talk about like what I'm asking to do here, like for the sake of service, right? It's helpful to know, okay, and that may theor in theory change, right? Then maybe, but this, it's an act of, it's a, it's a mode of service to say, well, this is what I'm, this is what I contribute to the universe, you know, this perspective, you know, this is how I, and so where we've gotten so far is that, um, there's awareness, there's service, there's somehow in mutual um, relation. Um, maybe there's this engine. So, I mean, I was just jotting down here, like service energized by awareness, but then it got more complicated, you see, but. Okay, I'll also, um, I think, add into that uh, absolutely local slash locally absolute I think the way things are locally is absolutely how they are. Things locally are absolutely how they are. And for sufficient localities, that can include large space, time, and conceptual spaces. However, those absolutes are local in their absolutism. And that's what I would call, um, in my wondrous wisdom, I would call it a constructive hypothesis. It's kind of like, think, like without that kind of hypothesis, I'm not going to get anywhere with absolute truth, you see. So it's saying, like, there's certain things I need to suppose in order just to get anywhere. And you phrased it very well, but it's saying, look, like, if I can run into limits in my own imagination, you know, and if I can do that honestly, and then maybe I can reach out to surrounding people and try to double check. But then pragmatically, like those are the absolutes that I can offer to say, look, from this is what we know, this is what we could suppose. And based on those suppositions, we could try to communicate with extraterrestrials or ant colonies or whatever, saying, look, like this is how minds work, right? This is what we know based on our mind, my mind, your mind. 
And I mean, maybe we're wrong, but like, that's what we have to play with, you see. And so in as much as absolutes could be useful or relevant or pragmatic, like that's, that's what this is. So you can yeah, see yes, the, where I mean, I'm coming from. Yeah, absolutely. If somebody believes that there's um, six eggs in the container and there's really four, quote, really four, it still is absolutely true that they think that there's six. So, for right. example, we've done a lot of work on assertion-based knowledge architectures where every assertion is absolutely, truly that assertion. Now, right. whether they assert something with an internal semantics that another reviewer says is true or not according to their own criteria or rubric or whatever, there's kind of a primacy of the absolute reality of the assertion as a container that is true and absolute, and then the, the contents can be subtended with secondary kinds of semantic tools. And a lot of the debate is like about right or wrong mm -hmm. has already um, happened implicitly or explicitly. Yeah, there's already this implicit machinery like to set up until you get there, right? Like, and so again, like in the wondrous wisdom, like these very uh, strict distinctions between right and wrong are considered like these are truths in the scope of nothing. You know, like a system has to be so well defined, you know, that by the time you get there, you're really talking about nothing in particular, because like, whereas truths about everything, they're all true. <laughs> you know, like anything you would say about everything is like everything is hot, everything is cold, everything is good. Like it doesn't really have anything to latch on to. So everything about any like so like, you know, every medicine is good. OK, so that sells you nothing. But any medicine, you know, is, let's say, useful. Right. Well then at least you have to have some kind of knowledge, like, well, what are medicines about? How do they work, et cetera? But like some medicine is useful, like aspirin, let's say. Then you have to be very particular. But like no medicine is useful or whatever. You see, that's going, you can say negative things like that, but then you're going to have such a, it's not really going to apply to anything. You know, you're going to be so strict. This is just a general. Or another example of the constructive hypothesis that kind of plays to what you're saying Um if communication is about, let's say, me wanting to engage somebody else, and I know nothing about them, right? Absolutely nothing. But the idea being that um, I um, I have this arrow, X, I mean, you know, this relationship, X, arrow, Y, right? So that's just the, that's just the assumption of the setup, by the way, that, well, I'm engaging somebody else. So then given that I don't know anything about them, but then I would suppose that they have the same framework. That's that's at least, uh, you know, if I'm going to play that game, I'm, I'm I'm supposing they're going to play that. They're going to be you know, familiar with that game. Otherwise, we're in big problems. So then the semantics that I use, I would use that to code my semantics, you see. So because the situation is that. So without making no more assumptions, I might as well use the assumptions I already made and code on that, and then assume that they will also understand that, and we'll play that game that way. So that's a very, a lot of mileage getting out of very little things. Yes, with increased situational awareness of the cognitive environment, you are able to modify your communications, linguistic and otherwise, in service of love, truth, wisdom, etc., and again, like, you know, I was 17 or so, uh, I'm 59 now, but like, so I would do these divisions of everything. I realized like this concept of everything is the first absolute that I can get my hands on um, because it has uh, no internal uh, structure. It's, you know, chaotic or orderly or whatever, you know, all things are true. It has no external context. If you think about it, uh, uh, it includes you. If you put it in a box, it includes the box, let's say. Um, if it's in the universe, it includes the universe. It's the simplest algorithm, uh, which accepts all things. Whatever you think of, you just dump into everything. So like you're everything and my everything and a poet's everything and a president's everything is all the same everything. Uh, so you can call it whatever you like, but if the algorithms match up, it's the same thing. So one person may call it love and one person may call it, you know, money or whatever it is. But but and then the final one is that it's a required concept that I everyone has it, but we can't get rid of it. You see, we can't get rid of it. Um, we all have it. So we couldn't have learned. How does it? Well, we couldn't have learned it because everything we encounter is bounded, you see, but everything is unbounded. 
So we can't learn it from the world that we live in. So it must have already been with us, you see. So it, we couldn't have learned it um, because it's it, there's nothing there's nothing like that that we encounter in the universe. Um, we can't get rid of it, but we all have it. And so again, like this is pragmatically, it's an absolute like you could claim that well, somebody else doesn't have this concept of everything. You know, it'd be difficult for you to claim you don't have it because then you'd be taking a stand. And when you take a stand, it's with regard to everything. So you're applying this knowledge you see of everything implicitly in your actions. And so then if you want to claim somebody else doesn't have it, but see, then it's your problem to go find that person who doesn't have it. It's not my problem pragmatically. Like pragmatically, we have an absolute. This is about as good as we're going to get. So when I was 17, 18, I figured out these arguments. They convince nobody, you know, because in the sense that they don't make people receptive to cooperate or cooperative, but they make me feel like, well, I'm receptive and cooperative. You know, I, I, so I think it's similar with this absolute truth. It's like, well, you have a lot of, you know, ability to argue like why that would not necessarily exist. But the point is, is that so long as we're making progress with regard to this, and so long as you feel comfortable, which is the essential thing, would you feel comfortable with it? Can we find a description? We'd say, I don't feel boxed in. I don't feel categorized. I don't feel, this is basically a fair description of me. Like, so for Kirby, it's clarity. For me, it's living by truth. Um, uh, for, um, Oh, for uh, Jerry Northrup, it's the maximum Goldilocks entropy principle. The Goldilocks maximum entropy principle, like you know that it's a hard principle to apply, but you know you can do the maximum case, the minimum case, but there's a sweet spot. So this idea that there's a sweet spot entropy maximum entropy principle, you know, but that's how you see. So it's this aesthetic vibe that he has, um, and then we'll go to relationships with truth. It kind of matches up with his relationship with truth. So th that might be the easier question, um, but why don't we try it? Uh, I'm just wrestling with you here. So we were saying, I was saying service energized by awareness. Now, then you brought in this absolutely local is the local absolute, right? Like, so how would that relate? Perhaps local service driven slash in feedback with local awareness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Comma. Local service in feedback with local awareness, comma. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm writing this down. Absolutely. Comma. Beginning local. and ending with absolutely. Just lest anyone think it wasn't bookended or bookmarked. And then in between the bookends of absolutes, we have a dialectic with uh, infinity flow, active inference, infinity flow of action, awareness, inference, and all of that for what? To what end? And that's the teleology. And that's where we step explicitly outside of the merely historical material mm -hmm. and enter into a prospective or speculative, or just other temporal concepts. We're getting there. <laughs> I have to kind of like catch up with you, right? So the heart of that was like local service and local uh, awareness. And how are they related? Like everything's local to where it's local too. So then I go, all right end of using local just then it doesn't add any value or meaning it's not a differentiator except in a socially signifying way so um let's remove the local part um but local entails absolute as per the locally absolute absolutely local distinction mm -hmm. and so after we've um shed the the bookends mm -hmm. brought them onto the bookshelf and then put them back off because we didn't need them i really do think that we have awareness motivating service and service necessitating and requiring and augmenting awareness awareness motivating service and service it's like if i knew everything about the situation if i knew what my neighbors needed and i had the bravery and the capacity and the love to do it mm -hmm. then the awareness would 
I, I want to be the person who would choose the act of service and love, given the awareness. So the awareness just increases our scope. And then taking a stand in service, we may choose to increase, we may even choose to decrease our awareness in certain ways at a certain level. We might choose in service of a healthy morning tomorrow, I will turn off the light in my room to reduce my visual awareness. But maybe that increases another kind and it's all part of the bigger picture. But I see those two as being um, a way to zigzag or to spiral and to accelerate rather than resting peacefully in only one. Although at the same time, the accelerating circle can be understood as one still monad as well. Well, Unity one way to say it would be the spiral, the spiral of service and awareness. Is that um, sure on the X and the Y, and then in the in the imaginary in the I direction, imaginary for the fun, art, mystery, ineffable, okay, and everything else. So the fun, art, ineffable. How does that contribute, and how does this, how does that play into this in in your life, right? The... There's a lot to say on it. I was doing art and philosophy and spirituality mm -hmm. long before science mm -hmm. in that external way. Um, so it has been my primer coat. My, my deeper education, it's been the spaces between. It's helped make the work itself more fun and meaningful and aligned. And knowing that there is coffee and cream and loving my coffee with cream. But knowing that they are different liquids um, or just that there's so many ways to understand liquids and their mixtures and all of this. Um, they are not the same. Art is not simply science. I'm not even referring to the broader topics, just like the, the profession or the work of. Um, they're not simply the same. And yet there's a higher level in which they are. And yet in the operational level, they're different. And that difference allows us to compose and communicate across differences. So for me, the 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 heat uh, gradient question is about appreciation, respect first, not let's make everything a single temperature in the universe. And the information gradient question is also primarily about respect and appreciation first, which is awareness to get to a position of awareness of what to do and then determine what kinds of actions, cognitive, covert, internal actions, or overt bodily actions, what kinds of actions, um, given the awareness, are of service. And, and uh, when I listen to you, I think of like the gaps. Like, so there's these gaps between service and awareness, which, you know, are for fun, basically, or for art, you know, or for um, the ineffable, let's say, right, or for whatever, like, uh, and that those gaps are very meaningful, I hear. That's what, am I on track? Yes, I love gap respecting. And mm -hmm. I have many teachers and fun ways to explore this. Um, but yes, gaps are not always for filling. Gaps can be for respecting, yeah. jumping, filling, none of the above, the fifth option, the sixth option. Well, and then... Uh... You see, and this is a this maybe is um, peculiar a conversation, uh, not an easy one, but it's uh, extremely meaningful in terms of working together. Like the more you can see, the more I can kind of realize, like, well, what are we dealing with, right? Like, because we're dealing with your sophistication, your spiritual sophistication, and then I, that allows for communication, that allows for um, sensible work together, etc. Not working cross purposes, um, finding like what we actually really care about. But 
one of the things that comes from what you're saying is this idea of service, like service for what? Because it's very easy to have service that just is completely, you know, like disconnected from anything, you know, just to and you and know, also from even, reality. Even a doubt or a limitation I'm aware of is okay, service to others. And then is that just passing the buck or letting them right? It could be define. right. And then being, it's like being useful or like being helpful. These are all things I, I want to be useful and helpful. However, not only simply merely helpful, because at that point it is just subserving to someone else um, in their guidance, which has benefits as well, varieties of kinds of benefits. But um, it's, it's a tough, um, to, to hyperbolize, it's tough between having a solipsistic deepest value and a ex externally referential value because the solipsistic value can run the danger of, of narcissism or disconnectedness mm -hmm. while the externally oriented value, by referencing out it references nothing and everything and therefore doesn't even do what it should and i can speak maybe a little bit to that based on you know my study of that and thinking about that is that uh, the deepest value tends to be contradictory in a sense that uh, it's pulling on these different tensions like it's applying to you as an individual but it's applying with your relationship to society um it, it it has this uh, living controversy. And when we get to the relationship with truth, I hope I hope you're all right with time that we can continue. But uh, we're, we're, you know, trying to be concise. But uh, um, the point being that God, you know, as at least, you know, in terms of this, uh, well, whatever this God be, but the idea being that uh, God's deepest value would be some kind of love. But like, we're just like little aspects of love. Like, so God does not have like a focal point in a certain sense uh, that we would kind of like gravitate towards. And so really like values are kind of like a, um, well, like one way to talk about love is that God wishes for everything is loving, but we don't wish for everything. <laughs> you know, we're smaller than that. So we have values so that we wouldn't have to wish for everything. <laughs> like we were, but so those little values are like this uh, rift of, life and universe or whatever like that's where the contradiction in us we localize it so maybe to speak in your language like as, as instead of living absolutely like god on this just you know everywhere all the time level we say well why don't we be local but like why don't we have it where the local is absolute and the absolute is local and so we just have to have a contradiction in ourselves where we're going to kind of that'll be our personal contradiction where we kind of bring it all together right and you can see that like in what you're talking about, it is kind of apparent, like, well, okay, you have this service and awareness, but then you have these gaps, and then there's got to be this fun creeping in, and how is it all come? See, so it does smell like that, you see. And so uh, with other people, it'd be easier to give a name to it, and it doesn't have to be easy, but, but and it doesn't have to be so closed-ended, but just to kind of say, like, well, this is kind of like where that rift in the fabric is, do you see? As opposed to just friendship, you know, like, or... You know, like, let's say friendship, we don't have to go into all that, but because you're very mindful, you know, and you're very, um, not so much the mindful part, but you live this, you know, you've lived this, you've worked it out, right? It's a work in progress, right? So, but I think it's fair to kind of give people a clue and give yourself a clue. Okay, this is, because that's where you're accountable. Like, that's the contradiction you know, right? Like, my case is living by truth. Well, and it's not my personal truth. It's the absolute truth. But I don't know the absolute truth. How do you live by something you don't know, right? But I have some of my basic ideas, you know. I do my best, you know. I keep it so work in progress. But I mean, it's pretty foolish and contradictory. And it's not, you know, they're all unique. So so the question is um, maybe to give one more try and not to go on forever. But how would we sum up, like uh, uh, one other expression of like conscious awareness, you see, conscious, I mean, sorry, conscious service, right? Like, uh, it's just, a, I don't know what the adjective for awareness would be, but conscious, basically, or mindful awareness, right? Uh, but it could be mindful and awareness with a spirit of fun. You know? so, I, but at least something like that, that would kind of be a placeholder to say, well, this could be improved, the wording. You see what I want. That's a fair thing to want, I think, right? Uh, 
do you value your wanting? Um, yeah, because uh, I think that's part of like this motivating, like, you know, like, I want to, um, I, 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 I want to make progress, I want to be in motion, you know, I want to try, like, we can return to this, like, it, it could just be a blank, but it seems we came, you know, 80% there, why leave it blank, you know, and then what do I see, and then from a, from a, it doesn't help us grow, like, you know, if we have a placeholder, we can say, look, Daniel, like, you know, you can be held accountable, I think, like, maybe to say, like, Every politician should tell us their deepest value so we know where they should be leading. You know, if they won't tell us, they shouldn't be leading. And I'm engaging you as a leader. So that seems. OK, on that, I agree. That's very interesting. Also, I think that um, public servant roles should be legible and creditable. Uh, yeah, credible. like you so that so yeah, but a whole other topic. Um, and then well, that was where we started from, not, right? Like you know, legible, okay. accessible. <laughs> uh, if it's a public oriented role with people with many different backgrounds, that's especially important. Um, yeah. but to the eighty percent done, it's something in in the thousands of drawings that I've made, many many times. Um, it's like I'm looking at the blank page before I begin, mm -hmm. and it's beauty. It's a total beauty. Oh, totally it's beauty. beauty. It's about beauty. Beauty. Well, the it blank is page beauty. is beauty. And end to end, every stage along it, it's different and fun. And I'm just make, moving one pebble after another, one pheromone after another, one trace after another. But the goal of a drawing is not to, um, unless it's the specific drawing that one is going for, is not to shade every pixel. Right. So the spaces between what isn't drawn, spaces between what isn't said, is what gives the gaps and the holes and the dynamicism as well. Um, so because drawings aren't 100% shaded in, just that appreciation of the time course of a drawing mm -hmm. helped me understand way non-linguistically, not in philosophical mottos, or, or credos. And William Blake has one great um, marginal annotation in a book where somebody talks about how like a baby is like an ugly something. And basically Blake strongly disagrees. Oh. Because a baby is a beautiful baby. It isn't a stunted or or uh, an inferior adult. <laughs> it's not an ugly so adult. <laughs> Under, exactly, exactly. And understanding how something through its changes can can be absolutely what it is and fit. Well, well, even poets get to try to write haikus, but so this would be my haiku, like the spiral within beauty of service and awareness. So that that's taking place within beauty. I don't know if that's accurate or if that uh, if you like that, but uh... again, I just like all of them and all of the reverie of well, maybe those are the two guide rails, and we're bowling, and we're going down the middle, and it's the guide rails are there, but we we ne we just we're balanced between them, or maybe those are two attractor points, and there's a there's a double Lorenz attractor. Mm -hmm. It's like. Why would it even be one ever? Well, um, it's not about why. It's just about whether it is. So if it's not, it's not, you know. But but the idea is that it's more about looking at you. You know, it's like a mirror at your, yourself. In a pres it's a presentation of you. So like what I hear, though, whether it's these uh, adding pebbles to the blank page or whether it is... Um, uh, I think what you said, like being within the guide points, like right, there is some kind of um, there's some kind of like mindful um, uh, mindful participation, you know. You're you're not trying to have a bomb or a a dud, you know. You're trying to uh, have something that is. Uh, dancing the dance you know i don't know how to not not every dud needs to be resuscitated mm -hmm. not every bomb needs to be diffused mm -hmm. not every engine needs to be turned on mm -hmm. so we need the situational awareness 
to do our best at determining all of those things and determining and being aware of any and all histories and presents and futures, that wouldn't get us anywhere closer to make that leap of faith from is to ought. Deter sorry, determining? Having a... a, a, a so you no talk about situational location. awareness, right? Yeah. But so then you're saying every, like it's... If we had the location of every molecule in a car, mm -hmm. we still might not know um, what direction to turn at the upcoming intersection or what which wheel is going to go flat first. So right. that's why so, it's never enough. It's an enabling possibility to have awareness, but even across the bomb dud engine continuum of information gradients, there needs to be another level, let's call it service, to do what's right and relevant and appropriate for those gradients. And then there's another level, or maybe that other level is merely the um, interplay of awareness and service, but that, there, that service, maybe it is its own paradox and conundrum and tension, or maybe it engages also in relational tensions. Well, and I think I liked, uh, I mean, if I had to, I think like if I to put it in one word, you know, it would be this, what you just said is interplay, you see, and it would be interplay of awareness and service, you know, but, or, or possibly beauty, but like, but, but, but I think that the interplay is something that, you know, your, all of the things you've said have to do with interplay. Yeah. Or interaction. Mm -hmm. Interaction. In, yeah. In one word encompasses the objects and the process and the unity is plural at minimum two and the possibility of transformation through interaction mm -hmm. but not not the requirements it also invokes dewey's concept of intra action so there's a lot there but of course interactions are a dime a dozen they're a dime well, a billion well but oh. well um See, but so if we agreed on this one word, you know, and, and you you have, have a whole video where you explain more about, you know, what that could possibly mean. But you see, uh, out of 800 people, I'd be I'd be pressed to say if anyone else has ever said interaction, do you see? So it narrows it down by like a three orders of magnitude. It's not God. It's not, uh, let's say, it's, it's kind of related to freedom, but it's not, you know, like um, the good life or... You know, there's all these, uh, it's kind of related to everything. And it does relate to love, you know, potentially. Like, um, but can we conclude on that for now? Is that a placeholder we would we could use? Or or, or would you I fight that? Interaction. <laughs> with, with all of the asterisks and gaps left yeah. intact, interaction is okay. a good And one. see, like, if, if you were, this was back when I was organizing independent thinkers, but then, like, you would lead the interaction working group. Then which would make a lot more sense. But and so then also when we see knowledge engineering, then we really understand. But it's really about interaction. So like one of the things I wanted to say was, for me, it's not so much about archiving um, information as it is with um, letting people run with things. You know, what do we need to do? Not so that people can access Franz Narada's uh, knowledge, but so that they would run with it. You see, and that's a very different problem. It's a different engineering task. So I don't know, you know, we'll talk about that. Uh, and we've kind of gone over an hour. I would like to ask uh, very briefly, at least, um, but this may take another hour. Like, what would be your relationship with truth? How do you look at uh, truth? I think a lot of the um, associations have been already raised it needs to be gone into more detail what is meant by it but whatever is actual is true it really is truly that way that's one sense and, and words don't need only one sense there's also um normative deontological concepts of truth um, that can be somewhere between metaphysical and aspirational. Mm -hmm. I have no issue with those concepts. 
And so that's why I don't ask you what what truth is, but I ask you like, what's your relationship with truth? So like when it comes down to you and your life, right? Like, how are you dealing with truth? Uh, what is that all about? What is the truth then? It makes me think about um, from the most, uh, well, first off, we're, we're in the field of the true period by being mm -hmm. in the actual embodied form. And then now we're, now we're, oh, now we're talking about a nut we've left truth one behind. Um, this is Davis, California. Truth one has been left behind. <laughs> um, now we can enter into a space where we could talk about actual and or counterfactuals as being more or less true. Whereas at the first level, everything is equally true mm -hmm. through its existence and glory, actually. Now, in this second concept or layer, I think about the continuum day to day from like, is that a true line of Python code? Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody would say, is that a valid line? Mm -hmm. Is it true? Is it, you know, but it's like, but then there's like a parenthesis that's missing or there's like an extra space or something. So it's like, that's the most syntactic. And then we move into the realm of the semantic associative truth. For example, in constructing the open source active inference ontology, like, is it true that a blanket is composed of sense and action states? Sure. Is it true that a blanket is composed of fibers? Yeah, a different kind of blank. But is, you know, so there are statements that can be evaluated as true or false within a space that's already lifted up off of the first prima facie level of existence. Um, and then syntactic, semantically associative, impersonal. Then there's a variety of even higher spaces, such as the um, semantically asso semantic or narratively associated not closed end, like a question whose truth value may not be resolvable um, finitely or due to the incompleteness theorem or halting problem. Then there's the social and the human and the, the human interaction and intersubjectivity, multi-subjectivities. And that once we're talking about this um, thinking through other minds, like, is it true that I thought that they thought that this, it's like, well, there that there's the actuality of that. And then that opens the door to the discussion of what truth means further. And all, all of this kind of tower of, of Babel of truth happening in an environment of something true. So what I... Um kind of condensed that too and i think it for me it resonates with the things i was talking about these scopes you know like of everything and anything and something and nothing that i mentioned you know in my own way before you're, you're saying it in your own your own way but the truth as a medium or perhaps simply a space that we inhabit which has layers of defiantness um you know as a tower of babel um or that this, this is like in a in a more condensed form that it's a, we inhabit a space of truth and that it has this uh, these layers of increasing definedness. Um, is that... Um, I feel that we are grounded, whether above and below or faster and slower, or finer and grosser, mm -hmm. but we are sandwiched with truth. And then we put two and two together in the spaces between. So what does that mean that we're sandwiched with truth? Like, let's just say that we were talking about structural integrity of a Lego structure mm -hmm. rather than truth integrity. Um, I feel like a child playing with Legos in the room, but there's a structural integrity at the scale of a Lego, which is what mm -hmm. allows it to be a Lego mm -hmm. that I'm abstracting over. And then there's a structural integrity of the room that is enabling there to be a space held. And the goal isn't to fill the room with Legos, mm -hmm. but then that is the space in which someone could say, 
um, look at the table with the Lego um, constructions and say, is it true that you made that one? So there's a very absolutely local, intersubjective social layer of truth in that room, that waiting room, that can be a conversational and there's multiple plural truth concepts um, with the room, but, but even talking about the Lego's structural aspects in the room is happening at a certain spatial temporal frequency where faster and slower things already have the property that is being sought in the meso. And so, um, well, so I, I'll say it again as I'm kind of thinking down, but I'm maybe making up this word middle space, but truth as a middle space within which we have the freedom of conversation or let's say a freedom of, uh, so that's what I'm hearing. Um, uh, truth as a, yeah, whether a middle space, conversation space, battleground, um, field of play, field work, field site, that's where truth is unfurled or um, deployed. Which of those or, sounds like most uh, best, you know, kind of like most fun or nice or accurate for what, you? What does? At this moment. In terms of space, like you rattled off about seven or eight, you know, the field of play or the... Field site. Field? Field site. Oh, S-I-T-E or? or yes. S -I okay, as a field site. So that's like for ant colonies. <laughs> or... it, it, it could be the, the desert and the field work. Okay. It could be spatial, temporal, or semantic fields, electromagnetic fields. Um, it could be S-I-G-H-T, like what you see. It could be a growth. I don't hear it every day, though. I think that's a biologist term. So, but that's a, that's fine. That's fair. Truth is a field site within which we. Truth is at. Truth is at, or could be, or we could talk about truth while we're at the field site. It is not a field site. Oh, okay. So truth, truth is a. We're talking about truth at the field site while also that field site being sandwiched inside of or between deeper truth and other concepts. Well, so, okay, so truth as... There just are simply multiple definitions. No, but I, truth I mean, as, the, as the, it's the, it's the, it's the circumstances. I mean, you know, like you're saying, like it's the, it's the shell, right? Like truth is the frame or the shell or the, on the one hand, like it's the enclosure or. Right. First, it's the merely actual. Okay. Then right. there are secondary, that, right? then within the space of the merely actual, within the room where we're building Legos and looking at ants, then there's a conversation to be had. That's definition two. And then. And definition three would be that which buffers and bounds and gaps even the field site, which truly buffers and bounds the field site. Oh, okay, so that's three. But so when you say truth as the actual, what where is that sitting in all this? It is what it is. But I mean, actual. What are you referring to? Like, what are you talking about? Uh, um, the actual what? Yes, there are some complexities with, you know, oh, like this this solid pen right here, but of course at what space or temporal scale. Um, just the way things are, whatever thing we're talking about, the way it is, whether we empirically assess it at all or accurately, the way it is, it is that way. And if 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 it isn't the way it is, then it is the way it isn't. Right. So truth as the ways things are, actually are, right? That's one. Then two, mm -hmm. that opens us up for syntactic, semantic, narrative questions. Like, is it true that the third letter of my name is an N? Like, that's a subspace that we've, little thought game that we've created within the space of the actual definition one, where someone could say, is it why it's like well no that was not true 
but it was true that they said it was Y. So that's the that returns to the ground floor, which is nothing actual is untrue. But that doesn't mean that every student gets 100% on the multiple choice test. So then the test is the game where truth layer two is assessed. And then I don't know if it's truth level three or four or five or zero or one or one and two, but there's another sense which may be the actual, or it may be something that goes beyond the actual, but at the very least separating out the actual from the semantically propositional I don't think that those are, that's not some wrinkle to iron out. That's, I'm just, uh, this is just about yeah. your relationship. And so um, there's the ways things actually are. There's the ways uh, that we then talk about the games we play. So Pardon? there's the way that the field site is, let's call that one. How the, what the fields, the, the field site, period. Mm -hmm. Two, games we play at the field site. Right? Three, what gaps and bounds the capacity for there to be games at the field site? Maybe nothing more is needed than a field site for there to be the capacity to love and dream. Or maybe there's more than the field site that's needed, but we need one to exist and we need two to talk about it in any useful way that isn't just conflating truth with existence. So uh, in the first one, I understand what true means. It's the actuality of the way that the field site is. Now, when we play these games at the field site, what's true about them? Or like what's true with regard to in, in their context? What does true mean? Absolutely local quantum reference frame alignment. Like if we're playing chess, is it a valid move? I mean, it's like, well, but maybe we're playing playing a, a maybe it's a child i play chess with a child and it's okay if they quote cheat make a different move so um or we're doing a multiple choice test where it's like oh tricks on you b is always the correct answer to me so then it's like whatever the game is it's the bounded game that's proposed by a cognitive entity who is the truth evaluator so that's a cognitive truth concept so in the so word first, validity you mentioned, um, that would be, yeah, but, but you said like whatever's evaluated to be true, right? Exactly. That's where you have a reviewer or a critic or an observer with a rubric or a heuristic or a quantum reference frame. And, and they get to have their own truth. They get to have their own truth, basically. Like that's yeah. their. Yeah. And then, then the final thing is that there could be something that's enclosing. So within the field site, there's this notion of truth. Within the evaluators, there's a notion of truth, right? And then within some possible meta enclosure, there's a notion of truth, right? And may I ask, like, what do all those three have have in uh, in in common? They're all about some kind of like a validity from a per, of a perspective, right? Like, uh, it's just that the perspective is different, you know, whether you're a human in the I, field I... site playing a game or. I would almost pull away from validity and almost think more about viability because um, something being valid is whether it's been evaluated to be a valid English sentence, for, for example. But something being viable, like a viable speech act, is a broader set. Viable includes what could be actualizable. And so then the reason why the third truth concept I see as different is because for there to be, um, if it's a truth concept that always returns true, you know, like while true, do, parenthesis, amazing. But if there's any um, possibility for that third truth concept to be not true, then that would mean that there was field sites with people talking that were true and then there would be field sites with people talking that weren't true now there certainly would be differences in field site you know noisier and quieter or more people and fewer people but i don't see how any viable field site would be untrue so that is why i think once we go 
above or past the human intersubjectively true cognitive truth concepts asking and wondering if there is a post or a trans cognitive truth concept it simply is a mystery a fundamental one i don't know but certainly one that is different qualitatively from the second and the first but the, but the notion in each case i think uh you know, I'm suggesting maybe it could be like truth is the viability, and there would be the question of viability of what, but it might be like, a, I was thinking perspective, but you might say more concept, like is truth is the viability of a concept and in, in various, you know, in the relevant realm. So, um, which could be the actuality, it could be, um, you know, whether it's valid and, you know, whether it fits with the rules of the game, you know, it could be whether it is metaphysically um, supportive, let's say, of all of this, but that's just, you know, this is just to kind of understand you and to understand how you're different from other people, how you're the same, and then how we can translate, you know, connect. Like this is part of knowledge engineering in a certain sense. Like, you know, how do we, how do we explain, you know, where you, how do we interface with you? I think that's the, so would that be, if I said truth is the viability of a concept or, or concepts, maybe just plural. The truth is the viability of concepts in relevant realms. Is that, and then we could list the realms, but, uh, or say including, or just say. Possibly, I would also tuck interaction back in too. Truth. How would you do, uh huh? As interacted with, or truth arising through interactions of or like or viability includes its own interaction which is the viability of the agent in the environment or the figure of ground so viability of a thing for there to be thing means that there is a partition from non-thing so viability so that's maybe that's a partition like this idea you know perspective or concept or thing what is the kind of feature that uh, we're talking about here with regard to truth truth is the viability of what notion or or fact or you know object all of those are pattern or it could be pattern truth is a viability of a pattern that's very information yes. like yeah yes however again I, I i don't do these single sentence english definitions because it isn't simply the viability of a pattern, because then we wouldn't even need the word other than just to say viability of a pattern. So I, I, I understand the, the reason to... to. You don't think in language, but I'm translating you into language. That's what I'm trying to do, Steve. It's about translation. It's not about uh, you. Like, But I mean, it is about you. You know, we're trying to, tr you know, maybe if we had another language, it'd be, it'd be a little easier. But how would you, you know, you know what I'm saying. I'm teasing you a little bit, but... Uh, but truth is the well. I'm not teasing. I'm. 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 I'm self. I'm being selfish. Um, truth is the viability of a pattern. Uh, that seems pretty close. Or, I mean, that's kind of speak. Is it? Truth I think also jumps like is it speaks to what you're saying. Truth one. Truth one is the is the mere existence of pattern. Mm -hmm. it isn't. Is it true that that's a quilt? Yeah. Then truth two would be in the cognitive interaction at the field site. What is the evaluative outcome of the pattern of perception? And then that that's radically plural because people have truth concepts that include everything. But but my truth two concept that is accommodating that plurality of others as truths is that given their sensory input, their inference, and their evaluative criteria is to make the action either internally or in externally to evaluate something as true. And then... Just on catching up, truth is the existence in the in the level one, truth is the existence of what? Of a... Uh, of, uh... Of the pattern, the truth is what the, the actually real. It, it, 
we're talking about I a mean, pattern. Is that right? Or, or uh... yes, but again, I I I almost then after bringing one onto the table, I take one back off the table. Sure. Because a like let's just say that there's um there's no um car here. It's not that there's a false car in my room. Mm -hmm. There isn't a car. There isn't. There truly isn't a car. There isn't mm -hmm. truly a car. Mm -hmm. But it isn't that there is a false car. But it is false that there is a car. And so basically, I mean. I mean, another word that I would offer would be like truth is the status of a pattern. And the status could status be. status is true. But. But the status. Well, of the status. It could be. A, it could be. It could be a little bit more than that. It could be like it exists, or the status is that uh, it's accepted by somebody, or the status is you know. But that would never, to me, um, merit. X is this. Just that kind of sentence, I think, is deceptive, because truth can be arising from, or can be proxied by, the path or it can be reflected in the integrity of a pattern, but is sends at least me totally down the wrong path. Okay, so, and so but, but clearly like you're using way. the word truth as if it seems something you know about and that you, you know, that it's it's real enough in the sense that you're uh, able to think about it and have an opinion about it, you know, and have a feeling about it, intuition about it. So, that's what we're trying to cap. That I mean, that's kind of like this. And the reason I was doing that was because, you know, I just assumed people had a notion of absolute truth. You know, maybe academics didn't like to, but, you know, talk about that. But but then it turned out I had to question myself. You know, I started asking, well, how do people... And it turns out they had different ways of thinking about truth. So I started collecting them. And, like, you can kind of see it prob Yours will possibly, like, according to my hypothesis, you know, if my my findings are correct, it will may, may very well relate with interaction. Right. But but so that kind of once you said viability, it started to creep in, you know, or these evaluations. Right. Like to, I'm not worried about that. I, I just feel I'm confident that it probably will creep in there. You know, uh, we don't have to use a word. But um, status is too kind of like much of a noun type of thing. You want more of a verb type of thing. Or is that where we're headed or. Whatever type or whatever is being indicated in the positivist response, I would want to see also accompanied by its shadow or complement. As in, let's see examples of within a given truth concept, what is an, a true and a false statement. Instead of only pursuing the true, um, um Let's assess the light and the dark, and then we'll have the light accounted for super well, even better. But once we get into, instead of saying, well, say something true, well, it's like, say something false. But then that is actually like the question that tricks the gears. That's like, we'll say something false, but it's like, but whatever the content of what I say, it will be true that I had said it, truth one. But then there may be a value of criteria that allow it to be evaluated as false truth too. And yet at a deeper level, it may be true again. Well, and so one way to try to capture that is just to say truth is an opposite, you know, like just to kind of start from there. Um, but it isn't that truth is that. Mm -hmm. Because if well, they were, mm -hmm. if there was an equal sign there, then you could replace usages of T-R-U-T-H with opposite which isn't the case. Well, it, 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 yes and no, like you could say truth is an opposite and then you could focus on the opposite. You know, you can have a definition in terms of, you know, by opposition, let's say, right? Like that's, that's within the, but it's not really, it's not about how things are. It's how, it's really about you as a person. Like, how do you, how does this truth working for you? You know, how's it, it's, it's kind of revealing itself as you speak and you have thought a lot about it and you do draw these distinctions, right? And it seems multi-layered in the way you talk about it, um, which is interesting. Um, it seemed multi-scoped, you know, that there's, I mean, or, or like there's these different realms. It's like an onion and then 
we caramelize it, we make the French onion soup, we serve it with our friends. Okay. It's delicious and nutritious. It's the truth is delicious. <laughs> so, um, yes, finally. Well, I think, um, so I should conclude. Um, so maybe the score is 1-1. One, one. So we have a deepest value interaction, right? With truth, we have to, do we have anything to conclude on or or um i can keep going i don't know if but you know i don't want to drag you out forever we could we could meet in a week and and well we'll keep it going i um i mean i love conversation for what it is mm -hmm. but simultaneous asynchronous collaboration mm -hmm. to me he has a semantic bandwidth that is so much higher mm -hmm. Our ability to parse and evaluate and juxtapose formal claims is so much higher, at least for mine. And um, so I respect the unique conversational format. I love live streams, media is the message, all of that. Right. And it's good for surfacing informalities mm -hmm. and, and authentic personalities for later cultivation and development in the kinds of knowledge environments that actually let us go further than our very, very, very limited working memory bounds. Well, but I think I'm happy with this conversation in the sense that this is the kind of like that I, I think is time well spent in the sense of like bringing things to a head, kind of like, you know, grappling, wrestling and kind of seeing, you know, we went very deep, uh, you know, and you have caverns of, uh, space within you it turns out you have see and what is its yield it kind of says well you have a metaphysics basically you, it may not be explicit but you've done a lot of metaphysical thinking you've done a lot of and you you have a lot of parallel thinking which like the divisions of everything that i work with is all about saying that you know the Context uh, for comparing, let's say, frameworks or whatever, are these ways of thinking in parallel. And I'm just claiming that locally they're very well defined. And I think these are local absolutes. So what you're reflecting in, even in your sayings, like, you know, uh, act in first serve, right? That's kind of like this metaphysics or like in this, you know, it could be three, it could be more, but this idea that there's an actuality, but then there's a discourse, but then there's a context, you see? That's a very strong metaphysical statement, but it's just if we're a little bit more explicit, then I could say, okay, well, this is how I talk about that, as a po you see, and then, and then I think with knowledge engineering, the whole point being, uh, well, this is all relevant to that, you know, how do we, how do we hook into that? So maybe I give up for this time. You you <laughs> you you win. I think on the truth thing, but I think well, you can see what I, I want, resign. so I'll let it rest. Pardon. I resign. Yes, I resign. I resign. <laughs> okay. So then um, um, maybe I'll just say truth is what? <laughs> Question marker. Uh, I don't know. I'll think of I'll think of something. But um, would you end us with a prayer as I would love? Thank you. Let us appreciate this special and unique moment. Let us carry forward according to our deepest values and the truths and the mysteries. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, and he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And, um, we just, we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful and, you know, I, I want to support that. And, you know, 
our weekly or bi you know semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years especially so yeah that's why i'm a supporter